I want to turn to the words of Jesus and invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus sets about some simple words. Now, you, you, you realize when you read the Bible that God, even though the Bible is a big, big book, the first time I read the Bible through from, time, from cover to cover, it took me four years, okay? And this is a big book. But you realize when you pay careful attention, it's a big book because it took so long to write, and it has such a, an expansive presentation of God's dealings with humanity. But it's not a big book because God tends to ra- wax wordy. God tends to be able to say great things in few words. Have you ever read the book of Proverbs? Now, there are times when God cares enough to take the time to explain things carefully, like Jesus did on the Sermon on the Mount. But even in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was very terse, wasn't he? He would deal with the subject, he would clarify it, bam, you understood it, light would come into your mind, and he would go on to the next subject. When it, came, when it comes to the saving of the world, Jesus has things to say to us who unite with him in that work, because you realize that the influence of human beings who have been saved by Jesus are those that he draws into the work to be able to save the world. But his words tend to be very terse. I'd invite you to turn with me to Matthew 9, verse 37 and 38. Some very quick words that Jesus says. But because, just because it's terse and short and to the point does not mean that Jesus didn't mean something profound by it. It doesn't mean that we may not need to spend a little time unpacking what he says. Because I've noticed that though Jesus doesn't spare words, every word he says counts. And we do need to pay attention because they're directives for us. Um, So let's read this. Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 says, Then he said unto his disciples, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Okay, that's it. Jesus is done. He said what he needed to say. So let's you and me take this out and take a look at what Jesus is saying and see how this is our directive from our commander in chief, the God of the universe, seeking to restore fallen humanity back into relationship with himself and how this is a directive for our lives. Okay, now he's using a motif, an illustration, a parable. What is that illustration? It's the illustration of harvest. Thank you. Somebody's listening. It's good to see that. It's the illustration of harvest. So now, when I was a child, and we we need to understand this illustration. Some of us didn't grow up on farms, so we need to understand this illustration and then see how what he says fits into that. Understanding the illustration helps us to unpack the meaning of his teachings, okay? So um, he's using the illustration of harvest. When I was a kid, my preacher dad would leave Jackson, Mississippi area, Crystal Springs, Mississippi, and we would drive on our annual pilgrimage, like Pastor Richie is out right now on a vacation. We'd go on our family vacation to Kansas. And on our family vacation, we would go to my uncle's house and it was harvest time and we would harvest thousands of acres of grain. And when it was done, we'd come back and my dad would enter it back into another harvest, which was the harvest of souls in central Mississippi, wherever his district was at the time. And so I would like to have some children volunteers, because we want to take a look at harvest this morning, and I have, thanks to Wayne Suddeth, some practical tools of harvest. And I need three or four young people to be volunteers for me. I see a hand, yeah, come on up, come on up. And we're going to take a look at what harvest is all about. I need some more volunteers. Since you're our first volunteer, what is your name? Okay, B, you're going to be the farmer, and I'd like you to come and sit, stand right over here. Farmer B is going to stand here. Oh, good. Come over here. Now, I need you 
to be somebody that I'm going to tell you what you are. What's your name? Staden. Staden? Staden. Sterling. Okay, Sterling. You're going to be, because you're Sterling, I'm going to have you be something very Sterling. I'm going to have you stand right here, okay? You know, Sterling means strong, don't you? Can you make your muscles for me? Ooh. Okay, Sterling, st stand right up here, and I'm going to give you something really powerful to hold in just a moment. You got to wait for me now. I need somebody who's not only strong, but powerful. Do I have a powerful kid? I need a kid. Do I have a kid? I see, I see, a, I see some other kids. Oh, come on up. Okay, here we go. All right. You notice that Jesus personal, purposefully included young people in his teaching. Did you notice that? So we're going to do that here today. What's your name? Kenneth. Kenneth, Kenneth you're going to be powerful, okay? All right, stand right here, and I'm going to give you what, what your powerful thing is. Now, I need as many other kids as would like to come. Even one to stand right over here. We can have one kid or two kids or as many kids as would like to come. Okay, I see a bold man in red. Okay. Okay, what's your name? Ethan. Ethan is going to represent all of you, okay? All the people here, okay? Ethan is going to represent a field, though. Later, he will represent people, but for right now, he's going to represent field. And so that kind of looks kind of like grain waving in the wind a little bit on your shirt. So, okay, so Ethan represents a field. He represents this whole field full of grain, heart, acres and acres and acres and acres of grain. Now, Sterling is going to represent something and you're going to represent something that Farmer B needs to harvest the field. Now, if Farmer B is going to go and harvest the field, what do you think she needs to harvest the field? Do you think she should just go into, let's say she has a thousand acres of grain, she should go with her hands open and just pull it all together and go carrying it to the farmhouse, right? Oh, you need tools. Okay, so you need a tool. Well, before she goes, she needs to put on her farmer hat, okay? All right, and she needs tools. So since Sterling is a strong man, we'll put a strong tool in his hand, okay? There we go. <laughs> All right. Now, let's think about this carefully. Well, now, what kind of tool would you need to harvest grain? Would you need a wrench or would you need a bigger tool than that? Okay. You'd need a bigger tool that the wrench would work on, right? Yeah. Okay. So now, do you have an idea, Sterling, what kind of tool you'd need to harvest grain? A winch. A winch? Would, would, that would be very helpful if that tool got stuck. Let's just say that tool has big, huge, round tires. What do you think it should be? Okay. Say combine. Combine. Oh, you see, so smart. A combine, a big tractor, not just a little tractor, a big, huge tractor. And it would have huge wheels, right? And you'd need a huge wrench. So hold the wrench right here. Now, if you had a tractor, a big, huge combine to go out in the fields and scoop up these grain and take it to the, to the silos, you need one more thing. If you had a nice, beautiful, Massey Ferguson combine, or John Deere, excuse me if there's farmers here that have loyalties, um, what else would you need? You have a farmer. Farmer B is going to drive the combine. Come on over here. You can be here to drive the combine. Let's see here. here here's the steering wheel. I'm just kidding. Okay, so um, what else would farmer B need along with her combine to go and harvest the field? Okay, so you'd need other tools, right? But assuming that we're, we've got our tools in place and we're going to use the combine as the example of the actual going into the field to harvest that stuff. What? You would need fuel because otherwise it's just a hunk of metal sitting there, right? So you need power. Thank you, Wayne Suddeth, and I'm sure this is the first time that a gas can has ever been brought to a stage. So this is, here you want, want to hold it there and be sure you don't spill it. Okay, this is the power. Okay, so you would need the fuel that goes in to the combine to go and harvest the field. 
Okay? Now, Farmer B, I'd like you to stand over here for just a moment. I want you to remember this picture. This is a visual. The farmer, the fuel, the combine, and the field. Okay? You guys got that picture? Okay, now, I want you guys to come and help me harvest this field for me. Let's put your, put your hands out like a combine. Let's scoop this guy right off the stage. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. You guys can go back to your seats. Thank you, man. And yes, that gas can has a protective covering underneath it, under the pulpit, just, just in case you were wondering. So Jesus is saying to us that the harvest is plentiful, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Jesus is telling us something about the field out there. He's telling us something about the lost humanity that we need to give the redeeming message of love to, and that is that it is plentiful. People, people are savable, aren't they? People can, can develop a right relationship with God, aren't they? But as we're thinking about the field for a minute, why doesn't God just knock on everybody's door himself and redeem them back to himself? Why? Do you hear? We're thinking about this, aren't we? All of us are thinking about why. Why do we have people that turn against God in our lives? The harvest, though, is lost humanity. And the reason why is because it is a relationship that was alienated. I don't know if any of you folks have ever been through divorce court, but in our country right now, we have this huge rash of fallen marriages and fallen families and divorces and crashed relationships. And if any of you have been through a broken relationship, you realize that in order to reconcile that relationship, often you cannot go directly to the person who's alienated. There is a need for mediation. There is a need for something to happen, a go-between, something to happen. And there's nothing better than someone who knows both parties and has a trust relationship with both parties to heal a relationship. It's not rocket science. For those of us who know that God is trustworthy, it's not that difficult to sit down and say, listen, I'm a human being too, and I know that God is trustworthy. Well, all my life, I feel like God has let me down. You may be talking to a person. Say, I understand that, that you, you feel that way. Tell me more about your story. They tell you their, their story. They're not talking directly to God. They didn't want to talk directly to God because they're angry at God. They have been alienated against God. But the field, though they are alienated against God, they're intelligent human beings. They will listen to somebody else's testimony that they're not alienated against, somebody that they learn that they can trust, a neighbor, somebody that is not imposing or, or scary to them, maybe an older lady, maybe a man that they work out at the gym. They will listen to somebody else. And if you bear a testimony of God's goodness and his trustworthiness, they'll think about it, and they can be won back into a relationship with God. So the harvest of people that need to be reconciled to God, Jesus says they're plentiful. Plenty of people would be redeemed back into a right relationship with God, just given the opportunity. Isn't that an interesting perspective that Jesus is giving to us? So from the field standpoint, he's saying that the field is plentiful. It's white with the harvest. It's, it's available to us. If we want to win the world back to Jesus and literally save their lives, it's available to us. So there's this huge field. And then God has called his people, his disciples, the church, the farmers, right? In this illustration, using, using the illustration of the field, and it's just a, an illustration, but that's us. And ultimately it's Jesus, but it's us. And what does Jesus say? To make the connection you know, a farmer taking a pair of scissors out into the field, that's not very effective, is it? You need to have the tool that's going to do the job. 
And what is the tool that Jesus says? What is that tool that Jesus says is going to do the job? In this text, Matthew chapter 9, we're just paying attention to the word. What is the tool? It's laborers, isn't it? It's laborers, it's people. It's people like you and me. That happens to be the big combine. People who are effectively able to go out into the world in some redemptive way, in some intentional way, to do something that reconciles human beings to God. But there's also, for every combine, to use our illustration, there has to be fuel. And Jesus gives us the fuel in this brief text too, doesn't it? You see how much Jesus is giving us in this text? What is the fuel that Jesus gives to us? I heard it. Prayer. That's powerful. So you have Jesus giving us how to save the world in two verses. You have his people, the farm, and the farmer, and the church. They have prayer that gives power to the combine, which is the laborers, that wins the entire world for Jesus Christ. It's a simple, beautiful model. Now, we as human beings, sometimes once we see a model, we just need to think about how to apply that. And I'd like to share with you thoughts about what it takes to do that. And I want you to think through this with me. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to just preach at you. I want to work with you to think through the process of how are we going to do that as God's people. We are his family on our father's farm that cared desperately about the interests of our daddy. We love him. When my, my mother and my father and all of us kids used to go out to Kansas, we cared about the farmer. He was Uncle Steve. Uncle Steve had been the, the man who had tossed me up and laughed with me when I was a little boy. He is, was a man, and he is a man, who loves me. I cared about the farmer, and we care about Jesus. And so we want to know what is it that Jesus is asking for us to do. Prayer and going into the harvest and harvesting the field. I'd like to share a simple concept that the Lord has been dawning on my mind and I'd like to share it by asking questions and, and thinking about it through. If we, as God's church, have a purpose to go out and be a saving influence in the world, and the combine is an effort of laborers united together to do something, what are some of the needs for that group of people that are gonna go and be the combine to go and harvest the wood? What are some of the needs? Okay, they need physical sustenance, what are some of the other needs? To, to, to mobilize a group of people to get a job done, what are some of the needs? You need leadership. You need a plan. Hmm. You need resources. You need support. Motivation. Good job. Is that? Kathy, you said something? Okay. Training. Training. Do you, do you, do you see how just as a combine has to be kept in ship shape to be able to do the job, that group of people need to be well organized, well greased, well fueled, and prepared to go out into the... It, it, is, it is taking Jesus seriously and, do, and, and simply developing an organized effort. Now, the College Drive Seventh-day Adventist Church, I want to praise the Lord is an example of an ever-developing, organized effort to bless this world, is it not? Praise the Lord. So, my study has been, all of my life, what is Jesus' directives for organizing that work? He has specific directives for organizing the work, and we're talking about some of this more and more on Wednesday nights, but I'm wanting to think of those big wheels of the combine as being, an, idea, as, as being a, an illustration of that organized work where you have a hub 
moving out into the field and the various spokes of the hub going out into the field and every person being plugged in to fulfill their unique purpose, their unique gifts and talents to the world. I want you to think for a moment, what is it that you love to do for Jesus? That you love to do for Jesus? Not what you do every day, but just if you had the opportunity, what you would really like to do for Jesus. Okay, just just think about this for just a minute. In specific, what are things that you specifically would love to do for Jesus? Now, me and my brother um, just over the shoulder had a contact this morning that he's a welder. And he shared with me, and there was, a, there was like a charge in his voice. He's, he's finding out that we're doing field schools, teaching practical skills and gospel outreach skills together. And he mentioned, I would love to share my welding skills in a context for Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that the neatest thing? So what would you love to do for Jesus? I love, I love when, when an illustration of what we're talking about is happening right now. What would you love to do for Jesus? How would you like to use your life? How do you feel called and passionate about using your life for Jesus? The illustration is the hub of the wheel being the church, where each person is meaningfully plugged in, and together we roll out into the field. I'm using word pictures to help us to think about this. In the third world, when a missionary goes to a bunch of tribes that don't know anything about Jesus, maybe they're malicious, hateful tribes of people that know nothing but warfare, okay? Let's just say and missionaries come wanting to teach them love, wanting to teach them a new life, and they're all worshiping demons, and, and, and they're tormented by superstitions, and the, the disciples of Jesus are coming, missionaries of Jesus are wanting to do something to make an inroad. What does a missionary do? A missionary sets up a mission station, doesn't he? He sets up an organized effort, and then all the missionaries begin to have their place plugged into the mission station. The doctor begins to go out with medical medical outreach. The preacher sets up evangelistic outreach. There's things that are all plugged in. And as every single person comes to a knowledge of Jesus and is baptized, they come to the mission station and they find what they can do to carry the gospel of Jesus back to their people. They get plugged in. The Lord wants to plug you in to his hub. And those of us who are in leadership have a responsibility to begin to develop and then to continue to develop an efficient, organized hub of ministry so that each person can be plugged in. So that each person who has a burden for Jesus can be meaningfully plugged into the whole. Because we are one body, the New Testament is very clear on, and all of us together It's the laborers are few. It's the group of us together that's going to harvest the field. It's not one of us all by ourselves standing on a street corner with a placard and yelling, okay? That's not Jesus' method. Jesus' method is all of us together, uniting together. If you want to understand more about that and think more about that, talk about that with me and with Richie because we have an ongoing discussion in terms of how to create that hub, that mission station. Now, I just want to just say here in North America, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was the fastest growing group of Christians in the United States in the late 1800s. People would come to the Seventh-day Adventist Church from other Christian churches and denominations to study how is this church booming like it is. This is crazy. This is such a fast-growing church because we were highly organized. We're doing outreach for the community and incredible things. The church has matured, but with maturity, sometimes we forget our roots In North America, we begin to be a sending agency to to send people and resources into the third world because we realize the Seventh Avenue Church was organized for one thing, and that's missions. That's the whole reason why we were organized. And so we begin, starting with Jay and Andrews being sent to Switzerland, we begin to send missionaries, missionaries, missionaries to the outside world. And in in North America, we begin to forget that we have a mission field right here. We were rich and increased with goods, the most prosperous nation on earth. And part of the reason why the United States of America is so prosperous is because we begin to have advanced health care and advanced ways of approaching life. And part of that was because God's work had launched here and God's people were working here. And it changed our world. 
and we've been sending things out, but in the last 30 to 40 years, the, as the population has been increasing, we've been increasing by two to 3% a year, but the population has been increasing by seven and eight percent a year, which means that here, while our church has been expanding in the world, the message has been going out here in North America, there has been a slow decline. Have you noticed that? There has been a slow decline. When I was here as a kid in the 1980s, there were two Adventist churches where now there is one. And I praise the Lord for this one beautiful church. But you do realize that as much as I'm so excited about the way the Lord has sustained his work in central Mississippi, you do realize that there are some indicators even here of slow, gradual decline. It's not because the work is slowing down. Do you realize that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the number one fastest growing Protestant denomination in the world? It's not that this work has slowed down. It's just that here at home, we've had a tendency to be sending out, and we forgot that sending out needs to happen here at home as well, too. And so I would encourage us to think of the mission model. So we have the missionaries that are plugged in together here, and then you have the fuel. Now, what again is that fuel? What is that fuel? Prayer. Now, we want to focus for just a minute on that prayer, okay? I used to work at Student Financial Services as an entrance counselor for students coming in to get their education at Andrews University. And as a counselor, I wasn't worried about their academics. I wasn't worried about their class schedule. I was worried about the funding to get them through their education at Andrews University, which was the second highest cost education in the state of Michigan. It was very costly. At that time, it was about $20,000 a year to get through your education at Andrews. It was, it was horribly expensive. And so here you have a student. Now I'm going to change our illustration, but visually I want you to follow. Here you have a student that needs to get an education, right? Okay, so this is our new illustration. The farmer in the field, and now we're gonna replace the farmer with a student. A student needs an education, and to get an education, to get that degree, to get that education, what was it that a student needs? I'm, what's that? Well, the money's good, but first of all, he needs classes, right? It's, it's the classes that get him the education. So, but you're right. To fuel the classes, you got to have money, okay? So in that illustration, the student needed two things. He would come to student services, and he would get his advisor, and he would start setting up his classes. He'd get everything all worked out, and then he would come to student financial services. He wants to take 16 hours of classes. He would come to student financial services, and mom and pop don't have money. They're broke, he doesn't have any money, he needs $20,000 to cough up. I mean, it becomes an issue, right? Because his education needs to be fueled with something. At Student Financial Services, which was the power for a student to get their education, we recognized that not having the money was very dangerous for students. So we had many advisors. I was one of many advisors that would hover over student accounts. We had the students broken up in the alphabetical orders, and we had advisors focusing on various levels of the alphabet, focused on the needs of their students. And every day, if the student would drop down into the red, which means that he didn't have the money for the education that month, it would show up on the advisor's screen, beep, 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 so-and-so is having a problem. And we'd have to call the student and say, come in, we need to talk about your account, right? We'd have to bring them in, talk about their account. Because you can't let it go forever, otherwise they bottom out and they lose the opportunity the next semester they can't come back because they're not paying. So we hovered and it was organized. We had, we had an infotech guy that was taking care of the computers and the systems of the advisors. We were so organized and so calculated to make sure they had the money for their education. Now let's take our illustration again. What was the fuel to harvest the field of the world again? It was the prayer. It was prayer. The harvest is plentiful, but the labors of the few. Therefore pray, Jesus said, to the Lord of the harvest. 
we need, as a Seventh-day Adventist church in central Mississippi, to have prayer ministry that is as organized or more organized than any university student financial services. I'm putting something out there. May the Lord cause this to awaken somebody who is called today. If you study this, we could, we could preach all morning just on prayer ministry, but I'm telling you, if you are 60 plus, if you're getting older and you don't have the energy anymore to go out there and hit the field and share the gospel in that way, did you know that there is a call for you and specifically it has to do with prayer ministry? But we need prayer ministry to be as carefully calculated. We need to have every person in this metro area that this church is responsible for, every person needs to be prayed for. Every block, every street, every little town, every outlying region needs to be prayed for, prayed for, and prayed for. And let me tell you something. Let's just say one of our young men decides to go out and give Bible studies in that area. That young man needs to be prayed for. Let's say a young woman has a burden to minister to the single battered women in a certain area. She needs to be prayed for by his, her prayer ministry over that area. Do you see how we need to be much more intentional taking Jesus seriously? We need to have a prayer ministry that is as organized and as calculated and as funded, hopefully, as a student financial services in one of our universities. I'm not joking, we have gotta take the Lord seriously. We're winning the world. We need to also have our outreach plans as carefully calculated as a class schedule to gain a doctorate or a master's degree in education. We need to be as carefully calculated and planned. My life and my goal and my burden has been to pray through that, and I'm discussing it daily and weekly with the Lord, but also with Pastor Richie and with this church. That's what he invited me to come to specifically take the outreach aspect of the church and to turn it into a well-greased machine. And folks, if the Lord has given you a vision, an administrative vision, or any contributing vision to how to be calculated and how to be specific and how to be well-organized in winning the world of Jesus, you need to be talking to me. I need to talk to you. And, I, and if you're interested in hearing what the Lord has shared with me, because I have visions that come directly from the Bible that I would love to share with you, and I don't even have time. There, there's not enough pulpit time for that kind of stuff. We're gonna, it's going to take we're us pressing together and spending hours working this thing out and developing this and organizing this because it takes organization and effort and enterprise. Are you, are you folks understanding, thinking wise, how we need to begin to think more concretely about the words of Jesus? He, he, he's very terse. We're not gonna go to other scriptures this morning. This is one, two verse scripture. Jesus says that we need to take him absolutely seriously and we need to get off of our Laodicean, lazy stance. As human beings, if we don't have a vision, we die, okay? The scripture is very clear. And the problem is that we forgot that Jesus himself gave us our vision. So we need to take this vision and we need to study it and we need to do it, folks. Are you with me? Amen, let's do this. I would like to take just a moment I would like three of you to share. I, there's a mic. Jacob, if you could grab the mic. Um, it, I'd like three of you to, to, to speak in one or two sentences what it is that the Lord has given to you to share the gospel with the world. It doesn't have to be eloquent. It can be one sentence or two. Okay. Prosperity, love, and the willingness to, to share. Thank you so much. The willingness to share. The Lord has touched his heart. Give me two more. What has the Lord specifically put on your heart? Yes, Kathy? The Lord has put on my heart to show people love and hospitality and to witness to people, and most of all, prayer. Prayer is a primary important. Okay, so witnessing, hospitality, and prayer. These are huge. Those are very specific things. Thank you so much. Yes, Jacob. 
I feel that God calls us, me, to give mercy, empowerment, prayer, and action. Okay. Prayer, mercy, empowerment. Okay. Now we're, we're dealing a little bit conceptually. For the last person, I'd like to have a specific thing that the Lord has called you to do, rubber meeting the road. Anybody here? Yes. Um, to me, for me, it's being on praise teams. Okay. And singing for him, because that's, that's what I'm doing. He gave me the gift, and that's what I'm using it for. I'm using it to glorify him. Okay. Specifically, she feels that praising the Lord, Sabbath, giving that, because that's part of the reconciled thing, to, to praise Jesus versus the opposition is part of the reconciled experience with God. Thank you so much. I do want you to call your attention, your bulletin, I love the Jacks, I mean, I keep thinking of a jacket. The College Drive Church's bulletin, I love, because of this little flap right here. If you've never filled that out, fill it out. Um, and be in prayer, in terms of what the Lord would have you to do. Remember that we are all called, and I would like to make a call this morning. If you are willing to be part of the answer to the dilemma, the great dilemma that the king of this universe has, to win a lost and dying world to the Lord, and you would like to do something that, that involves your talents, your dreams, or even the sacrifice of yourself and your dreams, if you're willing to do whatever Jesus asks you to do to share the reconciling work with the world, I'd like to invite you to come forward. And if you would like to, after we pray together, if you'd like to stay by and share with me, I have a piece of paper and a pen, and I'd like to write down the burdens and the concepts that you have that you would like to see happen in your life and how you would like to be plugged in to the church as it reaches out to the world. So please come forward if you'd like to join Jesus in sharing his reconciling love with the world and feel free to stay afterwards if you'd like to share something specific. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the call that you've given. And Lord, we have a growing team of people in this world, in this part of the world, that are willing to practically go and do something for you. Amen. And Father, I pray that this team would grow. I pray that we would be always ready to give an answer, but also that we would take what you're saying seriously and that we would share the gospel in careful, organized ways. And I thank you in Jesus' name, amen.